Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Bankole Uluafemi. I'm editor in chief of techabal.com. This is Techabal Live, the fifth edition. And today I have with me Mark Essien. He's a co-founder, he's the founder and CEO of Hotels.ng and a super DIY freak. Um, he likes to uh, make sure that his mechanics are not cheating him. And if, if he can figure out what is wrong, he will uh, with whatever device. He also likes to make tables in his spare time and create interesting things out of Raspberry Pis. He'll be telling us all about that later um, in the broadcast. And also joining us today is Ife Dayo Oladapo. He's the CEO and founder as well of Grid Systems. Now, Grid Systems, they make a, a, a meter that allows you to figure out um, what the most efficient alternative source of power for your house or office is. It helps you track how much power those things are generating and figures out how you can save costs, you know, by just looking at all that data. And I, I know I botched the explanation, but he's going to explain uh, better what Grid System does. Uh, he's joining us today, and we're going to be talking about the subject of maker culture in Nigeria, specifically whether Nigerians are going to figure out how to make hardware, which um, from the feedback we're getting is a super interesting subject. So um, I think we're going to start with uh, Mark. Uh, let Mark uh, tell us a bit about some of his interest in maker culture and stuff he's done before DIY. I'm going to post a link to a blog post he did, by the way, uh, about turning using a Raspberry Pi to power their call center. And you can speak to that as well, Mark. Um, okay, so first of all, I don't know if everybody knows this, but my bachelor's degree was in computer engineering, and computer engineering is basically hardware, right? I only did computer science later in um, in my masters. Um, so I've always been kind of the hardware guy for many, many years. I used to work as a software developer for hardware products. So um, generally, things like CDs, uh, like CD players. Yeah, I invested a lot of my years just knowing how to program CD players, uh, like the hardware of CD players, how to read CDs and so on. And that's very complicated knowledge that's completely obsolete right now. Uh -huh. um, now, obviously, so recently, the, I, I just tinker around mostly. Uh, I've done the thing like the Raspberry Pi, so building a call center um, using the Raspberry Pi. It was our first call center before we now moved on now to much beefier hardware. Uh, things like, you know, just simple things like making tables or other kind of stuff. Like those, those are the kind of things I like to do. You know, so for me, I'm, I'm a hobbyist. I'm definitely not a professional in hardware, but I like it. Like it's something that I enjoy and I do whenever I can. But you did build a, a call center out of a um, Raspberry Pi, the link to which um, um, Osarame has posted in the live chat. So you want to explain how that came about very quickly? And how that worked out? So, yeah. So the um, what we had initially is we had um, we we were using cell phones. So when we opened uh, when we had hotels NGM in the beginning, we we're using cell phones to just receive calls. But there were much better ways of receiving calls, like you know, doing things like call transfer, call recording, all the PBX stuff, basically. And there was there is an open source software called Asterix, and using Asterix you can set this all up. So I thought, you know, why don't we just build a mini server, connect all our laptops in there, so every, and then uh, connect a bunch of dongles, to, uh, sorry, connect a bunch of SIM cards to it, and then every call that comes in, we can receive it through the Raspberry, uh, through this little server. So we've got the Raspberry Pi. In order to be able to receive SIM card calls, um, for which Asterix is not really, like Asterix is not normally used for it, we needed to use uh, these internet dongles. Yeah, so if you take an internet dongle, which can basically function like a, a phone, you plug it into the Raspberry Pi in the USB port, then using that, you can receive a call, transfer it to the Pi, and then distribute it to each of the computer systems. So the very first kind of PBX that we built was that one, and then we ran the company for six months on that Raspberry Pi mini server uh, PBX, basically. Now we're still using the same system, but uh, we changed to a much bigger server, we now got a 32, um, 32 slot SIM card thing and so on, but it's based on the same technology. Fantastic, so, super cool, super cool. All righty, Fedayo, uh, the man with all the gadgets and ICs behind him. <laughs> tell, us, tell us a bit about your background and, and what Grid Systems is. Um, well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I think it's an interesting topic you picked. Um, so I've been, 
a maker for as long as I as I can uh, remember. So like as a kid, I would take stuff apart and uh, sometimes I'd also manage to put it back together. And, uh, you know, that's how I sort of pieced together my my understanding of the world. And uh, I've always played with Lego. That's all. That's, I think, something that's also driven Lego, driven my uh, my creative hardware side. Um, I studied electronics, also heavily focused on computer engineering, and um, most of my career I worked developing embedded systems for the automotive industry, um, so specifically powertrain control systems for diesel engines, and um, a little bit on the chassis side as well. So um, I've done mostly software in my career, but software that's very, very close to the hardware level. So a lot of assembly, a lot of C, a lot of real time. And um, yeah, so grid systems um, came about um, as a result of my trying to sell renewable energy solutions in, uh, in Nigeria and having uh, limited success. And so two of the challenges, two of the notable challenges that you have with solar power or renewable energy here is the financing models don't work because you have a very high capital outlay and at the same time uh, the cost of capital is very high the cost of borrowing money is very high so the second problem ties in directly to that in that if you don't have consumption data you can't really design the best possible system or evaluate it financially so we built a tool essentially for ourselves to be able to figure out you know how a particular client is consuming power so we can use this use this data to run energy balance calculations and tell you what combinations say of generator and solar will give you the lowest life cycle cost um, after the fact we sort of realized there are a lot of other use cases you can um, you know even if you're not interested in renewables you can definitely use it to reduce costs um, yeah so fantastic not sure. um, I've always wanted uh, if someone will build something that allows you to know when there is when Nepal has brought light, when there's electricity in your house, and that way you will know um, that okay, it's 10 p.m. now, and should I go back home or not? And it sounds like the grid meter is that what you call it? Um, uh, we call we call it the, the G1, the current hardware. So do, we're going to do you have the do you have the you make. Different if you have the grid meter, it would be great to show people what it looks like. Uh, you don't have to show it like right now, but like maybe have someone like, uh, you know, like maybe while we're having a conversation, just like okay, show, what people, um, show what it looks like. But I have another question, and this is for both of you now. Um, one of the things I've been super concerned about is that yeah. uh, Nigerian education uh, doesn't seem to prepare people, you know, for a career in hardware or to make stuff. And I wanted to understand what. I mean, you said you, you've always been making stuff since you grew up. Uh, there it is. That is what the, grid, the G1 looks like. And that device, you plug it into where? Yeah, this is it. You, you plug this where? Um, OK, so I can show you a live device. That's, um, you can see there's one on the wall. And it's got eight inputs. Three of them are connected to a three-phase generator, three to the grid. and. Um, the remaining two are connected to an inverter. So one for the input, one for the okay. output. So it tells us, you know, when we've got light from what source, how much power we're using. Yeah. Great. Okay, so back to what I was saying about um, how much of, uh, you know, maker culture or maker learning is inside the, you know, Nigerian educational pedagogy. And both of you have said you've been making stuff, tinkering for as long as you can remember. You've been super interested in Lego. He's been tearing down radios and ICs for as long as you can remember. Um, did any of this, you know, happen in school or was it at home? And, you know, how do we distribute this kind of experience to more people? Because we, if we agree that uh, Nigerians need to begin to get into hardware, it needs to start, um, you know, in the schools. What do you think? Um, you know, um, I, went to, I, I went to ISL. And we had, uh, we had a machine shop in ISL, and I think this is probably typical of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of schools in Nigeria. I've n I never saw any of those machines in operation once. So we, we had all this fantastic stuff. We had a lathe, a milling machine, uh, a fixed foot drill, but we never actually saw uh, any of that stuff uh, in action. 
Um, I do think we got a, you know, a concise and good education in terms of, you know, the basics, the sciences. Um, we did learn a lot of stuff, which even at the time was obsolete. So, for example, in technical drawing, we would actually we would use actual physical drawing boards. Um, and I think we had jets, junior engineers, technicians, and scientists. I, I, I competed, and I think I won. The jet once. club. And but I do think the thing with the thing with the maker culture ultimately starts at home, and is sort of intricately linked to the DIY culture because. I think here in Nigeria, you know, something something goes wrong with your car or with your house. Most people sort of immediately defer to uh, the professional craftsman, to the mechanic or the carpenter, to the plumber. People don't try to fix stuff at home. So I think kids don't really get an opportunity to, you know, see their parents figuring out even simple things like how to put a nail on the wall, you know. And uh, I think another thing is that we don't respect craftsmanship. Um, we are over focused on academic education and um, we don't pay craftsmen enough. We don't have an educational system for verifying the skills of uh, sort of everyday journeymen and craftsmen. Electric anybody essentially can become an electrician. Um, there's no certification process, and yeah, they're not, these are not necessarily professions that we hold in, in high esteem. And I think Mark. it's uh, it's a cultural problem that encompasses all of society, schools, and the home, you know, as well. Mark, uh, what is your perspective? Home school. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think I think that uh, working with hardware is more complex than, for example, software. And software it's relatively easy to teach yourself. With hardware, it's it's much more difficult to teach yourself. And it is something that should be done in in schools. Yeah, it's not a secondary school. Um, it's not a secondary school subject because it is a little bit complex, and you need a much broader foundation before you can actually do well, or you can start understanding the concepts of hardware. And I think that in the universities, first of all, they don't they don't do enough of the of the actual teaching of how to build how to understand hardware, like to understand the basics so that you can build on top of that. That's problem one. And the second problem is that there is no real, there's no real goal to hardware hacking yeah, in Nigeria. Like it, I could get really, really good at, at some complicated stuff, but I would probably do nothing with that. So because there's no, there's no short term perspective on how you can use that skill, there's also no long term perspective. Most people will not put in the time or effort required to actually know how to manipulate hardware properly. And um, so I learned software on my own, so I, I just studied it on my own. Before I went to university, I already knew how to code. But I actually had to learn hardware, hardware stuff in university because a lot of the concepts were just so alien and so difficult to understand that it required some teaching, some practice, and so on before I could get good at it. I would, I think that what should happen, if I were to advise, I'd say that across universities, there should be a form of standardized hardware hacking uh, classes or goals. So just simple things like, hey, let me put on an LED and let me switch it off or something, you know, moving on. And there's some kind of curriculum where you start off with some very basic hardware stuff and you walk your way through. So if you're in one of the courses that requires some form of hardware, like, you know, just computer science or computer engineering or electronics, you actually know how to build those things and you properly know how to do that. And that can serve as a good fundamental for you to build more, uh, you know, to do more if you are actually interested in it and you see some perspective for yourself in that particular subject. Uh, oh, oh, was asking a question. He was asking why you think uh, uh, hardware is more complex than, than software. Maybe you want to elaborate. Why I think hardware is more complex than software. Is that the question? Yeah, that, that was that was his question. Um, so it, it is much more complex. So anybody who has actually dealt with hardware would understand. With software, you have a very, very short debug cycle. So there's a problem, you simply debug it, you can you can just test in a minute. With yeah. hardware, your debug cycles are long. Yep. And not only are they long, you are you're affected by physical things that you cannot control. For example, you don't have timing issues in software. 
So in, in hardware, you have got things that, you know, you actually physically have electricity yep. moving up a wire. And it, it is not consistent. It's yep. inconsistent. Yep. So sometimes it, it goes with this millimeter, you know, at this um, this amount of time, sometimes slightly different based on environmental factors. So you have to factor all that in. And, and then after you have done all that, if there is a problem, with software, you can walk through each line of code and simply do it. With hardware, you have to probably just let it run and then try and figure out where the problem is. And that makes it really, really complicated to solve problems in, in uh, software, in hardware, I mean. I, I, but I, oh, I, I think you misrepresented. Not to mention expensive because you do have to procure uh, the materials to do this. So software is like you can you know, boot up a server or set up an ID uh, with, you know, little to no expense um, required, whereas with hardware, you have to, you know, either procure or buy actual physical components, and these things cost money. Now, it can be cheap to do some levels of DIY hardware, but if you want to, you know, actually commercialize, uh, then you're now talking about, you know, some expense. So I, I'm inclined to agree with you on that, but there's another question I wanted to ask, which is, okay, so it's, Obviously, the state of things from an educational perspective leaves, uh, leaves a lot to, de to be desired. But what I've seen from people like you is that there's pockets of maker culture. People who, like you, um, are do-it-yourself people. They are you know, craftsmen. They make things with their hands. They have you know, uh, a deep knowledge of physics, and they're willing to you know, make things. And the question I want to ask is you know, whether you think that there is a maker community or a potential for there to be a maker community in Nigeria, how that could happen, you know, who will be the driving force? So what would be the major, you know, catalysts for that sort of movement to happen, especially with um, um, hubs like the co-creation hub? I know that General Electric was working on stuff. Um, you guys are doing super interesting things and can be mentors as it were. And oh, I was trying to get you guys in trouble earlier, but I don't know, like, what are your thoughts? Because it does need to happen. Um, you? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think um, in order for a maker community to gain traction, it has to um, it has to have like a real impact on the market. It has to translate into products that we actually actually use. I think it has to be more than um, you know maker spaces and education. I think even you know, for someone going to um, there are a couple of events coming up. There's the Hacker Day event. I don't know if you know about that. And then there's also this NASA space apps. This NASA space space apps challenge where uh, there are going to be a couple of 3D printers. We're going to be there as well. Fantastic. If Shay is watching, by so the way, I think, shout out. I mean, so I think you know, for young people, you know, who are you know either considering a technical career or already almost done. I think you know people look at society towards the end of the game and they begin to ask themselves you know what you know what am I actually going to do with this skill set so I think unless we have enough companies or maybe a critical mass of companies that are using uh, these skills and these resources to make actual products I don't really think I'm it's glad that you mentioned a, a I'm glad that you sport. mentioned companies because we yeah. need to have a conversation about innocence uh, I, uh, yeah. I, was, I don't know if Mark wanted to say something to the question I asked before we... Yeah, yeah, I, I do. So I, I think the biggest, the biggest group of hardware hackers in Nigeria is probably the inverter makers, the people that actually make inverters, because they are there. Like, there's a whole lot of them everywhere, and they are all making inverters, and they are selling it in, in little, you know, pockets. And those guys, because they are not... They don't talk to each other, and there is actually no, uh, will I say, like, there's no way that they are sharing knowledge such that their inverters can get better. They never quite produce inverters that are as good as the imported ones. You know, so I think if a group like that came into existence, which is creating something for which there's a commercial need, and they started sharing information, started teaching each other, started producing better and better quality. Now, Outside of just being guys that can construct, they now have access to some to a method that they can easily get their product to market. Then I think you will find that a maker culture will develop around some kind of commercially viable product that is, you know, that is being used locally. 
And I think outside of a market or outside of a reason for people to spend a lot of time on this, the smart people that can do this will not do it. Because in the end, you know, like they have got to feed their families, they have to do, they have, they have needs that they have to take care of. And this is a really time consuming task that is not, um, does not leave a lot of extra time. So without a commercial driving force, I don't think it will really ever, um, it will come together. You know, and then those people that are actually some doing this already, they need to be grouped in some manner, which they, for some reason, are not naturally doing. Yeah. And then OO has been complaining about his uh, question being mis misrepresented. So let me just yeah. let me just answer that. So he's saying that carving yeah, wood is hardware and it starts from such basics. And why do I think it's more complex than software you cannot see? Um, carving, carving wood. Um, so he, carving wood is not... It's much simpler. Can I can I interject, Mark? Sure, sure. Can I interject? Go ahead. I think a lot of what you said is specific to electronics. I don't think hardware is necessarily harder, but it's more unforgiving. Um, you know, like you said, when you're when you make a mistake in software, the debug cycle is very short. But when you make a mistake with hardware, it's at, at best your your iteration is going to take a couple of hours and you've got a physical piece of something that's not going to work that you're going to have to throw away. Mm -hmm. So it's more unforgiving, even if you're dealing with something, you know, uh, quote unquote, as basic as carpentry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I agree. Great, great. It's great to see us. <laughs> I agree on that point. Um, but you, you were, you were going to conclude the point about um, inverters, um, in, um, inverter, um, inverters being a commercially uh, uh, a, a motivation, you know, something that people can gather around and say, yeah. gonna, uh, I like that example a lot. Um, the other thing I was talking, I want to talk about is um, the Innocent Motors um, person, which I've been doing some research. I, interestingly, I don't know a lot about what is going on at Innocent, but that seems to be, uh, I, I think you guys will know more about it and maybe be able to say a few things about it. And it's, they're supposed to be making these cars and we're talking about if you, you need this whole operation to do that. So that's hardware right there. People manufacturing uh, cars locally. Have you, you know, interacted with any of these vehicles or do you know, do you know about them? Can you say something about it? Well, um... I think it's, I mean, I don't really know. I probably don't know as much as I should, but it's interesting. I used to work in the automotive industry in Germany, so it's, it's interesting for me. First of all, I want to say, you know, hats off. I'm very impressed by what um, Innocent has accomplished. Um, I think he started out with motorcycles. And I think the math was he could fit 40 motorcycles into a container. And if he uh, broke them down, and uh, did mock assemblies, then he could get 200 into, into a container. And I think that's how his business started. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about how that translates to cars. Cars are much more complex than um, motorcycles. And I mean, if you look at back in the, in the 80s and early 90s, when we did have uh, Peugeot assembling cars here, the crux of it is that those those industries made sense because a lot of the local um, components, or let me not say a lot, but the most significant replaceable components came from the local market. So we were making tires, we were making brake pads, we were making um, car batteries. I think we were also making spark plugs. You know, So for me, it's a little bit questionable. So the, econ the economy is not just in production, it's also in the aftermarket because these are parts that you replace relatively frequently. So the economy of importing uh, most of your parts and then assembling, I think, is questionable. And I'm not really sure um, how representative, representative that is of what um, Innocent is doing. I definitely know that trend. we're not manufacturing as a current trend. You know? And then the other question that comes to mind, I mean, if, if I were going to invest in that kind of business would be how many new cars do Nigerians buy each year? And um, I think I don't think we buy more than 100,000 new cars every year, but um, I may be misinformed. So my, um, my own opinion on the innocent thing, I have seen no evidence that those cars are being manufactured, that, they, that those cars are Nigerian. Yeah. To me, it sounds like it's a Chinese car that is just branded with innocent. 
Yeah, like I've not, I don't actually see manufacturing. It looks like some kind of assembly plant and it doesn't look like they even do a lot of assembly in Nigeria. Um, so till I actually know that those cars are Nigerian, I will say this, this, is, this is us pretending that we are manufacturing cars. We are not manufacturing cars. Those are Chinese cars. And he, he can use, to me, it's somebody bringing in Nigerian uh, Chinese cars, branding them as Nigerian, and then using some political clout to make uh, the government buy those cars. Um, that's what it sounds like to me. And I don't know enough to say that it's otherwise, but I've not seen evidence of real engineering happening there. I mean, we intend to actually do an, uh, what I would call an investigation, you know, actually go uh, have a conversation with uh, the people, uh, people who've bought the cars, um, go to the manufacturing plant itself. Um, I think that if, even if it's assembly that they're doing, uh, <laughs> I think that that to some extent, um, extent is um, interesting. But obviously what we want to see is people being really souped nuts about it. So if there are infrastructural constraints around the actual manufacture of the parts, then that is a valid challenge that we now need to figure out how to solve. But um, the science, um, I think, needs to be local. I think people are not just like... I think, it, you know, even if it's just assembly, um, I do think that there are merits yeah. to, uh, to doing that. And I mean, I think uh, one lesson to be learned from the way the Chinese automotive industry has grown is that uh, I think in the 80s, in the early 80s, a law was passed in China so that if you were a car manufacturer, you could not sell cars in China unless you had an assembly plant in China. You know, so it allows them to do two things. First of all, it puts people to work. And secondly, it allows the smarter of those people to sort of learn and assimilate those ideas and use them in other local Chinese companies. Um, I'm not saying that that's what's going on here, but I do think, you know, whatever stage of, of um, assembly we're looking at, I think it's about gaining critical mass mm -hmm. and making more and more of those components there. And, uh, you know, if, for example, if Innocent is interested in getting some uh, ECUs, for their cars, I mean, that's something grid systems would be willing to, to evaluate and look at. Okay, so real quick, um, we're actually running out of time. We've been talking a lot, and if people want to dial in and ask questions, now is a great time to do so. Our guests are still here, Mark Essian, Hotels of NG, founder and CEO, Ife Dayo Oladapo, he's the founder and CEO of Grid Systems, and they will be happy to take your questions. Oh, oh is calling back in, I'm sure he wants to fight. <laughs> so uh, I'm, not look, I'm not looking forward to that, but uh, if anyone wants to call in, just let me know in the chat so we can kick him out because he's a regular. Uh, and we hope that his internet is not going to screw things up. It's just quarter. Uh, so that Go we can fight. get on with the just show. Quarter. He's here. Yeah. Uh, um, there you are. Thanks, thanks for having me. I, I, I just wanted to point out something, right? It, it's the idea of make our culture, right? Mm. Um, when, the way Mark said it, it put, it put the barrier too high for people to start participating. Like if Adayo said, I was in Jets Club in KC, I've told them I was in KC, you know? And Jets Club, we're trying to, they were, we didn't really do much of electronics. I don't remember doing much of electronics, yeah? Um, so most of the things we tried to use to solve problems were mechanical, yeah? Now, if, they are, if we are trying to encourage, um, if we are trying to encourage maker culture, it starts from changing the fuse in your um, in your inverter or whatever that blows, right? I always used to do that. I'm sure Mark and Ifeda always did that. I always opened my telephones, but I didn't really continue it in electronics. So we have to understand that maker culture doesn't mean you have to make a phone. It means that if your laptop breaks, you go to computer village and replace the your keyboard, right? It means that uh, I don't know your table breaks. You use your you use your hammer, your nail. You cut off things. So that's what I, I think we should try and encourage. Yeah. Now, if you have fundamental maker culture, then you keep on solving problems. The more complicated they are, the more you solve them. Because I remember on campus when I was in Uniben, most people assembled their own computers. But all of a sudden, people just stopped this whole maker culture thing. Right? So it, it shouldn't be that you, you can't be a maker until you, you put it together an inverter. You should, you should, parents should try and encourage their four-year-olds to repair their toys themselves. They should not just go and buy a new one. Then with that habit, when they see more complex challenges, 
they already have the fundamentals of putting things together, screen nodes, using a, so that that's just the point I wanted to make. So it's not, yeah, yeah. That's that's a very valid point. Um, I don't know if anybody knows um, of uh, a guy called Obi Naokwani who's creating something um, called a Makers Academy, and he's going to be setting that up in Enugu. Um, he's currently fundraising for that, and that's something I'm really excited about because um, they're going to be, you know, imparting technical skills to young children um, of high school age. You know, talk, things that you're talking about, like practical tinkering skills with um, hardware, and Hopefully those children will go on to become, you know, engineers and actually, you know, do things that will affect society, like hardware-wise. So I agree with you, it needs to, the bar needs to be much lower. Uh, we need to get people involved in hardware um, from a pretty much young age, which is also why the, what the Co-Christian Hub is doing with their robot club um, is pretty cool too. I think it's primary school, you know, students or, you know, junior or secondary school students that are in that program. Uh, so really super cool things that are going on. Uh, if there is no, I, I think there's a few more questions. Um, e e Bolarin wanted to ask a question, but I don't think he actually got around to asking it. Um, yeah, there, there, there are a few in, questions in, in the comments. There's, there's yeah. a question addressed that me asking if solar startups in are solar, viable yeah. in Nigeria. Please go ahead. Yeah, so... Yeah, so solar. Um, solar, I think, is one of the biggest opportunities generally in the world. And I think in Nigeria is very well positioned, or Nigerian startups are very well positioned to take advantage of it. Um, however, people need to understand like what the real problems there are. So it's not about really just putting solar panels. When you're using solar, you have a bunch, it, it becomes about power, the amount of power you, con you consume. And I think the real startups are around the people who can reduce the number, the amount of power that people consume. Um, so things like, you know, just when, when if you can run a house on maybe, you know, you're using 500 watts or 600 watts and you can run everything successfully, that means that you can use a lot less solar cells and you can run for much, much longer, which has a lot of impact for people in rural areas and also just in terms of the overall energy consumption. So I think that solar startups that do things around that particularly the high wattage equipment like ions or air conditioners or so on. It's very, there's a lot that can be done there. Or just things that observe how much power is actually needed right now. And let me adapt dynamically to that. Um, around that, there's a lot of opportunity. Also around energy storage, there's a lot of opportunity. You know, what well, people that are into that field need to dig in, understand a little bit more. And then from there, you know, develop startups that would actually save a lot of people uh, money. Somebody's asking. We're running on solar power right now, by the way. Oh, there you go. What? Uh, are you yeah. sure you don't want to? We're running on solar power right now. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. How come nobody is talking about the role of polytechnics in empowering the maker culture in Nigeria? That is the 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 yeah. The, I, have the to say, I have to say something yeah. about that. Um, yeah. I mean, like, I've had very good experiences with. Um, with people from polytechnics. I think um, generally on average, they they finish with a better hardware skill set and a more rounded skill set than people from, um, from Nigerian universities. So um, yeah, I think I think polytechnics definitely have a role to play. Um, yeah. I know I know that the legend was um, when I was studying law in University of Adoikiti, the engineering students would go um, to the poly in Adoikiti and outsource their what they final say, yeah. projects. <laughs> they outsource their projects. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. found that very funny. We have a caller. Uh, I'm just going to, from, OK, Eniola Bolari, who wanted to ask a question, is calling in. And that is pretty good, going to be the last uh, person that we're going to be having dial in. Uh, we the have actually gone over the forum, time that we have to spend here today. Um, there's something Thank I want to say, because there's a comment someone has made about the spare parts not being uh, Spare parts not being made here. So, mm. it, it, you know, a very crucial thing. I mean, it's very easy to sort of look at where we are technologically and give up hope. But I mean, specifically when you're talking about electronics, um, there are two things that need to happen. You know, hopefully within the next, within the next decade, we need to have uh, companies that produce printed circuit boards locally, and we need to have companies that produce passive components locally. I mean, we're probably not going to be producing silicon here anytime soon, 
-hmm. But I mean, the logistics of making hardware here is, you know, I make a design and then I spend four weeks waiting for my components uh, to arrive right. from China or the US. And then I realized, oh, I, I, I ordered the wrong component, so I made a couple of mistakes, you know. So I think, um, and to go back to what Mark said, communication is crucial because I think there are a lot of people working in the hardware space um, who don't really know anything about each other. Almost on a daily basis, I sort of discovered new things. So I recently discovered, for example, that they have laser cutters at Doculan, which uh, we would need for cutting stencils for... Um, our SMD PCBs, for example. So stuff like that. So I think communication is mission critical. And I think also building an ecosystem of mission critical functions for electronics, PCB production, mm. and production of passive components, I think is mission critical. Brilliant. Um, let Eniola Bolari ask his question or contribute to the conversation. Oh, no. Um, did you disappear? OK. OK, hi, guys. Um, this is my first time on this forum. I'd like to ask a fair dial. I'm super excited about your grid one. Um, do you do energy management? And um, is it possible to interface it to a system that can meter energy in tokens? Thank you. That's a rather technical um, question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by meter it in tokens. Um, what we're doing, one of the features we're working on right now, the existing system differentiates based on power source. So what we're working on right now, based on a lot of feature requests, is to differentiate based on power consumer. So as an individual user, I could, for example, see what device or what part of my house is using the most power. Or if I ran an estate, for example, I could see um, how, much, how much each individual house or, or apartment in my estate or apartment block is using. Um, and then... Yeah, we are looking at moving that towards a system that can be incorporated with a billing system, either for a microgrid or for a utility company. Oh, yeah. Does I answer your question, any other? Um, not, not totally, because um, what, what, what we are looking at is um, actually um, solar systems or energy in the rural areas, because of the high initial cost of acquiring these systems, to um, for them to like use a pay-as-you-go kind of model. Yeah until they actually um the hardware or the assets so to speak so um the system where they can get a scratch card or get text a token to pay for the consumption pending when they actually um pay off the hardware those kind of things that um i had in mind i don't know whether grid your your device can be modified to mm. do that yeah we do we do intend to implement features like that um not with the same device but we are building we also build uh, like you know, we also build inverters and charge controllers, uh, so we are looking at integrating features like that in the in the charge controller. Fantastic! Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Eniola. Thank and you. I'm sure that Ifeda will be able to answer right. your questions. Uh, um, do, you, do you want to put out your email address, um, you know, just in case people want to, or your Twitter handle uh, for people who want to get in touch after this? Is that um, okay? okay. I mean, I could just, just send. I could send a DM on uh, Twitter. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. You guys will catch up. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I don't know. Do you do you guys have any last words, uh, Mark, for Dion, um, real quickly? I don't. I don't think we've covered everything that there is to say. I wanted to talk about things like um, rapid prototyping. Uh, I, you did, you know, speak to the, to some of that in terms of the logistics and value chain of, you know, being able to have these um, components to hand and stuff like that. But really, just you know, anything to wrap up, and we can continue the conversation on the blog. Mark, are um, you there? I, yeah, I, I would just say that people shouldn't be afraid of hardware or afraid of tinkering. Yeah, and I think like everybody should just go out there, tinker as much as possible. Get as much help as possible from other people and then over time you just get good at it and that that will inspire other people who can actually start building careers and from there generate a much more formidable maker culture in nigeria thanks a lot mark well um i concur i think uh if you enter hardware you can't afford to be afraid of breaking stuff so I always say, you know, a good engineer breaks something at least once a week. 
if you haven't broken anything uh, this week, you're not trying hard enough. We, we, we set up a tree that talks in Freedom Park, and we had to take it down. Uh, and the biggest thing I'm afraid of is, you know, where are we going to get the parts to build it again? So all of those parts don't cost, altogether, they don't cost up to $200. We're talking about an Arduino processor, uh, NeoPixels. I think one of the things that happened was when we were um, two days into building the, the, the prototype, the technology we wanted to use, capacitive sensors, it didn't work. And we had to change to a whole new sensing um, paradigm. So we had to use um, um, motion sensors instead, which meant that the capacitive um, sensing ink and uh, the, the, the touch sensors that we, uh, and even the software that we coded um, was redundant. And we had to rewrite everything um, in a few hours before we had to present. So uh, uh, the, the whole breaking part resonates. I found that very interesting. Uh, it can be unforgiving, like you said, but then again, it's also very rewarding. Uh, so I think um, a lot more people should go into this. And um, if there, are, if you're looking for ways to get involved in um, hardware, um, you, you did talk about Hacker Day that is coming up when? Um, if it, uh, I, think, I think it's the 23rd. Of, of April? Yes. Um, there's also the NASA Space Apps Challenge that is coming up uh, in a few weeks from now by um, people that are working together to put, bring that together. Shea Olu, Olusha De Johnson, I can't quite remember how to pronounce his name properly, um, is working on that. That is also happening very soon. I would say to look, to look out for people like uh, Obin Alkwani and his Maker Academy. And obviously, there's Ife Dayo here, um, who has a wealth of experience in hardware and making stuff. Um, the Co-Creation Hub is also a resource. Um, so you should definitely check them out. And um, if you have any other resources that I haven't quite covered, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate that you just send those in so that we can put them together in one place for everyone to see. And fill out that form that Osaramen posted earlier in the live chat. Osaramen, please post it again um, if you want to be part of a maker community. And we will see how we can move that forward to people that want to lead that initiative. So do not forget. Um, we will do our best from here at, um, uh, from here at Tech About to see whether we can help drive that conversation forward. All right, then. I'm really sorry that we cannot take any more calls. Um, there's someone trying to call in now, but we really have spent more time than we plan to. It's a 30-minute broadcast, and we really expect um, respect people's time. Uh, thank you for joining us, all 301 of you that have watched this broadcast. Um, share with your friends, and we'll be here again next week at noon to have another conversation. We'll pick a new topic. And um, it will be a great time. Thank you so much, everyone, for, <laughs> for joining us. Bye, everyone. Do not forget to sign up to the mailing list um, so we can you know, hook you up with all the people who are doing stuff in, make, in making in Nigeria. Thank you, guys. Right. Ah, OK. Oh, oh, says to leave the room open. So we're going to bring him back in and make him a host so he, he can't take it forward. But I'm going to stop recording now. All right, everyone. Um, Mark and right. uh, I think I'm going to let you guys go now. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. All right.